Our first speaker this afternoon is Dr. Nihal Arfan. She is a consultant child adolescent psychiatrist, founder of the only service that provides psychiatric care to children and their families in the western region of Saudi Arabia. Originally, she was from Jeddah, and she's recently relocated to Riyadh, where she's head of psychiatry at King Fahd Medical City. Um, she is talking about functional outcomes and impairments, which are so critical to diagnosis. Nihal. All right, yeah, good afternoon. Uh, we're had, like, it's a bit of a slow start, but um, I'll try to keep, uh, to keep that in mind. Um, it's always a pleasure to be uh, with this team and working with Dr. Saad Imani. She's just a, a source of energy and empowerment, um, to, I think, to all of us. She kind of keeps everybody going. I'm going to talk to you today about the functional outcomes and impairment uh, for ADHD. Um, I think it's an interesting, um, I think it just there have been a bunch of interesting talks this morning and, and like Jerry said, we're just shifting gears a little bit and going to more clinical, um, in, in, more in the clinical arena. This is a, um, just a sort of a statement and I'm, I'm going to say it's way back from the year 2000 because it seems that over the past nine years we've really moved ahead. I mean, way back then, uh, you know, there was still con talks about, you know, does ADHD exist? Um, all of the controversy and how do you treat it. So the focus back then was more around, you know, the, the patient or the individual and, and not so much looking into the future and outcome and function. So I think um, what's happened over the past decade is that we're kind of moving more towards thinking about quality of care for these patients. And we want to, um, you know, one of the take home messages that we don't want to look beyond, just look down and beyond our feet when we deal with these patients and families. We want to think ahead with the families because that's a very common question. You know, what's going to happen to my child? Are they going to be a functioning person in, in this environment, in, in their society? Are they going to be productive? So these are very common questions. What do we already know about um, function impairment in ADHD? Uh, we know that these kids are going to have persistent problems with inattention if they are of the inattentive subtype, and they're going to continue to have some problems with their impulsivity. Again, you know, better controlled with, with medication. So it makes sense to think, again, when you're thinking ahead, knowing that this is a chronic disorder, it makes sense to prepare for the future. Um, so that when they are now in their teens or um, in, in adulthood, we have better services to accommodate them. Because we know that there, are, there is a wide array of um, functional problems that um, this sector or category of children will have. So again, academic, social, or workplace, we want to think about a different, um, say, concept, which is quality of care. We want to think about um, increasing cost to a government, to society and loss of money, again, maybe not so much in this part of the world, but more in, in the Western uh, regions where money is, is lost, in taxpayers' money is, you know, governed or pooled into um, care for this uh, sector of patients. So symptoms in any domain pretty much can give you um, functional outcomes that are not entirely good. So whether they're hyperactive, impulsive, or inattentive, how that can um, come out or be displayed in terms of the home environment, school, socially, or self. So as was mentioned earlier today, because of the prevalence of this disorder and its chronicity and the level of impairment, uh, we need to think more global, which is, you know, the, the public health concern that um, ADHD um, uh, plays. We know that uh, we have to plan for the future. Again, because this disorder, like there's no child with ADHD, there's no age group that, it's, that is immune, you know, whether you're, you know, a toddler or a child or adolescent or now into adulthood, like almost 8 million in the States with um, adult ADHD. Um, and we think that we're like really on top of things when it comes to the adequate diagnosis and treatment, but then we, we, we're surprised to see that maybe more than a third of of population who have ADHD are not treat, not even recognized till they're in their early adulthood. So that again tells us that something is missing. There's a missing link. What adds to um, some impairments in outcome? 
Now, the frontliners usually for these kids and families are going to be the primary care physicians and also the pediatricians um, to, to have referrals to um, like the tertiary centers where you can see the psychiatrist or the, the behavioral pediatrician. Um, again, it depends on which system of care you belong to. But usually, you know, we're talking about the frontliners. Because ADHD is very diverse and, and sometimes the, the symptom presentation can be complex, it's not as simple as hyperactive, impulsive, inattentive. Sometimes you get these families, it's just like you feel like you're really struggling. And if you are a primary health care physician who, who doesn't have the, the tools or the skills in order to pick out and, and, and sort of triage and see which are the patients that are going to need uh, more attention, more care, you're definitely going to have delays in the diagnosis and an adequate intervention. So this is just by logic. So it makes sense then, again, over the next 10 minutes or so, like every time um, we're going to be talking about a problem that we face, I'm just going to, you know, throw out some possible solutions. So it makes sense that managed care organizations, they have to really intervene at a, at a very basic level which can start off with, you know, education of the frontliners, because these are the ones that are going to be pooling all of the, the patients that we then need to keep following up. When you look at, like, functional impairments, we also look at costs, because um, any individual in the society is, is there to be productive. I mean, that's, I mean, we all want to have, we all want to be productive, and all families and parents of kids with ADHD, I mean, that is their goal. They want to have productive children, adolescents, and adults. So looking at costs, um, there's of course the direct costs related to the actual disorder, so treating ADHD and its comorbidities. And then you have indirect costs related to reduced productivity of that individual, and also like their earning potential that's lost because they're either you know being kicked out of a job or changing jobs. So that is not a very productive individual. So indirectly, it's gonna cost the society. Looking, I mean, these are I, I, just the numbers, the amount of money that, that is lost. Um, it's, it's good if it goes into good cause, but if you feel like you could do more to, to save that money and provide better care, then I think that's where the goal is. But the annual cost of treatment for kids with ADHD goes from two to $11 billion. And the psychiatric comorbidities alone, they cost something like from 40 to about $90 billion um, with alcohol abuse at the top of the list. Um, then with, with the functional um, impairments that kids will, will encounter, um, things that they pick up as they go along. So we know that kids with ADHD are, are, will start smoking at a younger age than those who are not. Um, and again, the, the whole issue of substance use disorders, they are more likely to use substance if they are untreated. Self, the sexual reproductive risks that they are at as well, you know, they begin their sexual activity earlier, um, they're less likely to use contraceptions at higher risk for sexually transmitted diseases, motor vehicle accidents, um, driving without license, speeding, crashing. Um, for me, the horror story for one of my patients, like he's very impulsive and he's just barely controlling on medications and he couldn't wait for the day when he'd get behind the wheel and like, so that was a nightmare for his parents and, and for me because um, he wanted to fly with that car. If he, could made it, if he could make it into an airplane, he would. So um, definitely they're at higher risk for accidents. Indirectly, the sad part is although these kids, a large percentage of them have just average or above average IQ, but because of an untreated disorder, they are less likely to succeed and they are less likely to achieve um, academically or in the workplace. So um, again, it brings us back to the idea of, um, you know, we have to focus more because it costs the healthcare system a lot more when they are being expelled or if they don't finish grade level. So it like costs, like in, in, as, as you see, more than three billion just in expenditures um, when these kids are dropping out of school. Um, when you compare the ADHD, um, like say uh, uh, high school graduates compared to regular, regular average, not non-ADHD, the income is $10,000 a year less or $4,000 a year less for the college graduates. And again, they change jobs, they, um, they don't really stick to jobs. So again, going back to the indirect cost. Um, 
Over the past few years, I've been thinking more about quality of life. Um, I, must be, I must be honest, like initially, I was so focused on making the diagnosis and making sure that I'm giving them the best sort of treatment, but I wasn't really looking at quality of care. And then, you know, started to look more at, you know, the burden that this disorder has on the child and the families and the mothers. And what kind of quality of life does this kid have in their family or, or their environment? Because, you know, if you are going to have a lower quality of life, it's going to indirectly affect other parts of your life. You know, one of them being just the, the criminal behavior or antisocial behavior where kids with ADHD are at higher risk. Uh, burden on families, I think, um, I think we couldn't stress it more. Um, a lot of us here uh, are working with families and um, I think again more focus on empowering, making sure that these families feel that they're supported, that they're understood, um, and that they're able to come forth and, and, and be expressive about whatever concern that they have about their child. This is one of, like, it's just a caricature of a, of a caregiver of an ADHD child. I've, I've seen worse. I've seen worse looking tired, exhausted uh, mothers, and it's just, um, it's very sad. So solution number two, it could be that um, the stakeholders need to really intervene at levels beyond those that are applied to other conditions or other disorders. So again, looking beyond just right in front of you. How do you improve outcomes in ADHD? Um, one of the things I came across was, and again, which is what we're talking about, is the medical home or patient-centered medical home, which is, you know, the setting where you can apply steps in adequate care, diagnosis, and treatment selection. It's very important, again, because of the diversity of, of the way it presents sometimes. So an idea came up is to, to, to kind of unify things. So you, the, the development of rating scales has really helped um, in that in that uh, area, using treatment algorithms and treatment guidelines from the AAP, American Academy, or from the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. I mean, you want to unify um, your, your direction. So um, we need to have a strategy for the long-term management of this chronic condition. I think education is paramount. The more educated your families are and your patients are, uh, the more likely you're going to have uh, better success. Um, interestingly, um, only 25%, this is one, in one of the studies, only 25% of patients, they followed up um, with their primary physician 30 days after they filled out a prescription. And this was only 4% higher in a psychiatric setting. Only 53% of physicians um, reported routine follow-up visits for the children with ADHD. So the introduction of uh, the National Committee for Quality Assurance's healthcare effectiveness data centers on education, um, patients and parents uh, being more aware of treatments. Um, and again, an, an, a very important area is the, the doctor-patient relationship, having more of a trusting relationship. And again, this is gonna enable them. I mean, I, I, when it comes to like particularly prescribing medications, um, for parents, uh, I always like I, I always give them that that space because there's no point of you giving it to them knowing that they're just not going to take it, you know. And oftentimes they feel guilty, um, they're concerned about side effects. So I think it's if they if they have that room to to express all their fears and concerns, they're definitely going to be more likely to have a trusting relationship with you and, and be more adherent to treatment, which in turn is going, going to give you a better outcome and less impairment of function. We're using the, the simpler, or easier to use, like extended release um, formulations helps in you know, keeping people on their medication and then identifying the non-adherence, if possible, by this pharmacy database monitoring. Now, we don't have that here, um, I think it would be great as, as one of the things to sort of, um, let's say, advocate for is to be able to know you can um, keep track of your patients, know who's, who's sticking to their medications and who's not. 
So again, it's, it's important to optimize the investments to identify which, pa which are the patients that you need to promote medication adherence because we do have families that are very good with, uh, with the treatments that you provide. You know, they religiously follow your behavioral interventions and, and they ask and they know a lot about your medication. So, so these are not the target group. So you need to kind of be able to fish out for those that, you know, are less likely to be compliant and put more energy and more focus on those. So again, in, in, in conclusion, uh, we know that it presents a, a major public health concern because of so many reasons and, and chronicity and prevalence. So we really want to look at quality enhancing um, initiatives in our managed care. So the patient is the center and you want to look at what you can do in your interaction with your, with your patient to have better outcome and then in your setting and then in your community and then in the health system that you belong to. Now, if you, if you look at it that way, then you're, you're definitely not going to be missing out on important parts in the care of your patient. So these, these interventions are definitely going to be costly to the, manage, the care organizations. However, um, if you don't do optimal care, your loss is going to be a lot greater. Thank you.